remitting for some projects that looks like have a lot in common making or wanting to make projectional editors for a new programming language of the future which is functional and statically typed Tyler in this list is a more general sub project related to hazel so I'll describe the shared vision of the projects as revealed by the features survey and then we'll have project presentations each team have one minute to have a, like a personal introduction of every member that is here and then four minutes to present something about the project and the idea is we are all intimately familiar with the space so hopefully it's not just the general pitch but also something that's specific and how each project is a little bit different followed by two minutes for questions and that will take maybe 50 minutes and then I will have an open-ended discussion panel where everyone is welcome to ask or answer or say anything so this is the shared vision we're making the programming language of the future which is functional statically typed has type inference but it doesn't work the way you're used to from Elm or Haskell no traditional type errors we have new UX solutions for that, like non-empty holes or fragments containing the type mismatch. We all like variant types and structural types, but at least for now, we're not considering dependent types. And unlike Haskell, we don't want pervasive lazy evaluation. The language should have syntax sure. Code layout should be automatic. Programmers shouldn't deal with that. Unit tests should be a built-in feature of the environment. The editor should have a text like UX. So we're not talking about visual programming languages, but also not text files. So a projectional editor that feels like text. What you type is what you see. And it should enable live programming. We would like it to work in the browser. And we believe that it will be a good fit for professional programmers. And this is everything we all agreed on. Then uh, in the document, I also shared stuff uh, that we didn't. So I suggest to start the project presentations. We can do it in the order I specified here, which I just sorted by GitHub stars. Unison, guys, I'm stopping the share. Great. Yeah, take it away. All right, I'll start with a short introduction. I'm Chris. Uh, I work on the Unison team as a developer, mostly working on the tooling around the language. Uh, and we also have here Simon. Um, do you want to hey. introduce yourself there, Simon? Yeah, uh, I'm Simon. I work on user interfaces at Unison. I'm a UI engineer and also do the user interface design. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see we also have Aria uh, in the room. Hey, hey. hey guys, this is Aria. I am one of the co-founders at Unison and also heading up the tools team and really enjoying working with Chris and Simon. And thanks for, thanks for putting this on. Awesome. Uh, yeah, we're really glad to be here and, and talk about kind of what we're doing and how that relates to everybody. Uh, I guess I'll start off with just kind of an overview of what Unison is for people who, who aren't familiar. Unison is a strongly typed functional programming language. Uh, we've got type inference. We've got a first class built in effect system. We've got first class support for distributed programming as well, which is a key focus for us. Unison is pretty unique in that it stores all of its code as a serialized content address abstract syntax tree. And we keep all of that in a relational database and we have a lot of tooling that kind of works around that semantic understanding of the code that we have in the database. Unison is, is placing a really strong focus on lots of the tooling that goes around development. So pull requests, structural diffing, semantically aware code hosting, documentation, all of those sorts of things. We would really like to revisit the idea of structural editing in the future, but it's not a, a key focus for us right now. We're kind of focusing on other areas of the workflow that uh, industry that we need for, for targeting industry. Some of the in interesting features that we have that are actually implemented and fully working in the current build of, of Unison right now is that we have structured and relational code base format, which we store in SQLite. Uh, we've got code which is identified by content based hashes at the definition level. So we actually hash and store by that hash 
every single definition that you write. That's types, terms, functions, everything like that. We've got a no build workflow. So as you write each individual function, you can add that into your code base. It's built and type checked exactly once, and then won't need to build from that point on as you add new functions. We've got a fully interactive compiler, which supports that workflow. So typically you'll be working in small scratch files and then committing that work into your code base as finished individual definitions. And the compiler just kind of works alongside you as you save your file there. We've got an integrated pretty printer. So uh, all of your code is formatted for you when you pull it out of your SQL database to work on, it'll all be formatted for you. We've got test caching already built in. So tests will only rerun if uh, something that they depend on has changed, which is nice. And you can actually commit those test results to your code base and upload those and share those test results with your team. We've got transcripts, which are a flow quite similar to something like a Jupyter notebook, where you can write code in a markdown document and have it evaluate and print out the results to an output document. And you can kind of iterate on it that way. We've also got propagation of changes through your code base. So right now we've got that working automatically for type preserving changes. And we've got kind of a guided to do workflow. If you make a, a type breaking change, it will guide you through the refactor that you need to do in order to get your code base working. That code base is always going to be compiling and working at all times because your, your definitions will, it'll still depend on the old working code until you've updated everything to the new changes, which is a nice feature. Uh, because we're in SQLite, we have indexes in there for doing type-based search, as well as dependency or dependent searches or searches by name, or, you know, we can really visualize our code bases in a cool way. We've got programmable documentation with support for documentation tests, type checking in docs. We make sure that all of your documentation is always compiling and up to date, which is great. Uh, we've also got a documentation driven blog engine, which we can run from our, our code hosting platform, a first class distributed computing system, as well as a first class kind of built in cloud solution. And that has support for distributing data to your code. We can distribute code to your data. We can serialize and distribute expressions in unison. So you can actually take a function, you can serialize that whole function as well as any closures it might have. And you can send that to a different machine and run that code in a different spot. And we also have support for uh, different security models there by limiting which effects you can run with our built-in effect system. We've got computation caching on that cloud. So if you do a large computation, we can actually cache the result of that by the hash of the function itself, and then look that up later. We've got our effect system is continuation based. So you can actually provide user configurable effect handlers for any sort of effects that you want to define. So that's pretty much an overview of everything that we have already working at the moment. And then we've just got a couple things that we have coming up that I'll talk um, about, which would include, okay. uh, sorry, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we said that we'll do a four minute presentation for each project. Also, yeah. just according to the survey, everyone wanted like to have a little bit of personal introductions and you guys didn't really use the one minute per member personal introduction. So mm -hmm. if you want to do that a little bit, just more in-depth introduction of yourself and your background or life on, or anything you want to say and others from the team, uh, let's yeah. get back to that and then let's do the two minutes of questions and responding to those. Sure. Yeah. Sounds great. I'll, I'll just take four seconds to finish right. this off here. So, uh, on the horizon, we've got things like semantic dipping, conflict resolution, heuristics and stuff like that. Uh, maybe pluggable syntax, hot swappable names. So if you have different languages, you want your code to appear in, you could, uh, support that and an integrated framework for doing kind of in browser server and client integrations there. So that that's pretty much an overview of Unison there. Yeah, we can move on to Q and A or if Simon or Aria have any, uh, anything they want to talk about with them themselves, introduce themselves, feel free. Sorry, I'm, I'm not, uh, this is Aria again, I'm not, I, I realized we didn't quite get the, the format. So I would, I guess I'd ask the moderator to just tell us ex uh, exactly how to proceed now. <laughs> I think, are we doing a round of introductions for everyone if so? If so um... uh, yeah, Aria, you can, uh, you can uh, just present yourself for one minute, just so we're all familiar. Oh, um, the goal. Sure. 
Sure. Uh, well, I mean, I did say a little bit about myself in terms of background. I grew up kind of all over the place. I went to school at Georgia Tech where I was studying machine learning, but I felt really like 90% of my research time was going into software engineering work and not into research work. And so I felt like I really wanted to step back and <laughs> find a better solution to the software engineering side and then, and then come back and get the actual work done. Great. And uh, Simon, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, so I've been, you know, professional uh, working since, I don't know, 2006 or so when I started out as a Rails developer a long time ago when that was like very, very new. I am from Denmark originally, but live in the East Coast of the States, although I'm in Denmark currently for vacation and hang out with family. I've been mostly focused on UI engineering uh, throughout my career. Cool. So anyone have uh, questions for uh, Chris and Unison on uh, what yeah. Chris described? Yeah, so you, you used to have a structural editor. And I think you've de-emphasized that or something like that. Can you, can you tell us about how that went and, you know, kind of the, the thought process and, and experience there? I can try to explain that a little bit. So as far as I understand, Paul, the, the CEO and co-founder of Unison, worked on a structural editor very early on, but I think he made a proof of concept and it was cool, but realized that there was other aspects of the Unison tooling and ecosystem that we wanted to develop further before tackling more polished version of the structural editor. So we're still hoping that we will very soon get back to that. But, but yeah, right now it's, there, there, there's nothing there. And, and so where that. do people write Unison files now, like, like in Vim or VS Code? Yeah, exactly. There is a notion of a scratch file. You, you write your Unison code, and then you, you have this Unison code base manager that sits side by side with your scratch file and interacts with you as you write code. So when you save your file, that program picks up the change and prompts you to add or update or do refactors and stuff like that. Like it sort of like commits it to the code base, if you will, via that flow. And we most recently got cool stuff working with LSP and VS Code that Chris worked on. Cool. So regarding the format, I'll just say that after all the project presentations, we'll have an open panel or if we have more questions that we didn't get to now or more general questions that aren't directed at a specific project, we can get back to everything. Okay, so I think I will... Uh... Can I ask one question? Yes. Can I ask a question? I want to do it now because it's a question that I think will come up for everyone as we go along. So you gave a great uh, tour of what Unison can do, and it made me really, really curious who Unison is for. Like, who is your so... ideal user? What is your goal in making the Unison project? Uh, Arya said... Software engineering is a headache, so why don't we make a programming language that does the software and engineering headache part of things, is the impression that I get. So could you please elaborate just a tiny bit on that? William, I think we all uh, answered it a bit in the shared vision, that also the projectional editor part. So Unison wants to have it, and they believe it's going to be suitable for professional programmers. That's true for everyone. And different projects have different views on whether they are suitable for end users and stuff in between. I think it's best to leave this question to the general panel after all the specific presentation, if that's fine. Okay, so I'll take my turn, which I hope would be a good demo of the format I suggested, but it's based on the various answers to the survey. So I'll first introduce myself. And Eyal, who is working with me on Lambda, has a similar bio. So I started, uh, I was interested in programming as a kid with basic and making games. And since about age 17, I started uh, working in the uh, industry and um, have been ever since in uh, various startups and um, also in Google. And the last decade, I have my own um, company with partners, Bootstrap company making audio effects that are used in uh, music and TV and movies. And uh, now I'll go to the Lambda specific uh, presentation. 
So uh, the aim is to take four minutes. Um, and it's going to be about something that Lambda does differently than most other projects. So I'm going to focus on two aspects here. One is our use of keyword arguments. So all the other projects are in positional arguments land, and we are in keyword arguments land. And mm -hmm. positional arguments, I think, in the time of languages like C, they wanted to save every keystroke and call functions like str, c, and p. You know, from C, it came to C++, to Java, to JavaScript, and most languages use positional arguments. But I think that IDEs change the trade-offs. And if you don't have to type the labels and they help understand stuff, then it's good. So in this case, we see the filter function implemented in terms of fold, which has four arguments. So fold is an operator and it has an argument on the left, an argument on the right, and two extra arguments, an accumulator initial value and a tail, if you're familiar with fold R and Haskell. And I think the labels help a bit readability. You don't need the labels for everything. This is similar to the Swift programming language. You know, when you have a verb, it works in some, a subject and an object, so not everything needs. And now I'll talk about syntax sugar. It's actually syntax sugar for passing a record of arguments. So there's two sides of it. One is there's a single argument, a record, and it, it accesses fields of the record, list field and a keep field. And this uh, internal lambda, it gets a record. So this is syntax sugar. Uh, just the parameter records. The other side of it is the application side. So this is just the fold function applied with a record of arguments. And the way syntax sugar works in Lambda is opposite than the usual. There's no unsugaring phase before compilation. It is stored unsugared and displayed sugared. So I'll just show another sugar you may be familiar with from uh, JavaScript. Field funds, if there's a field list with a value list, it can appear like this. By default, by the way, all the sugars are enabled. This is just for pedagogical reasons. But the way sugars work, if I edit it, it automatically goes out of the sugar form. So I don't have a lot of time, so I'll quickly show more sugars with an example. So I made a, I asked who wanted to, sorry, who wanted to test other projects uh, in a secret Santa, and I made a, pro a program to randomize secret Santa. It's using the imperative side of Lambda for randomness. So in this program, I'll make the window bigger so you see everything. So if statements, they are sugar for pattern matching and Booleans. Let expressions, right? If you see below, there was an if statement, but if I turn it, it becomes a pattern match. Let expressions are just beta redixes, just a lambda immediately applied with an argument. That becomes a let expression. Now, a lot of things people do like about positional arguments in Haskell or Elm is carrying or partial application. So we have a very useful sugar for that, which we call light lambda, similar to underscore syntax in Scala. Okay, I guess I'm out of time. So if you're curious, you can play with it yourself. Uh, any questions? Is there a commercial intent behind this or is it an academic approach? So Lambda is, we're not academics. It's a passion project. We want to make programming great again. Programming, I do it. It's a huge pain. Many stuff in programming are, and it doesn't have to be. I think it could be delightful, and uh, we're trying to realize that. It's uh, very ambitious, but uh, we've been working on it for a long time, and uh, hopefully it will become useful. Um, so the sugars, can they be uh, written as part of the program or like by the programmer? Or the um, so when I type an if, so if I type an if here, you know, I type an if, a normal if. Or otherwise, if I want to pattern match a Boolean, um, it will become an if. So wait, it's, oh, never mind. Um, I, I'm not sure if I answered the question, but you know, you write it 
either in sugared form or not, and it becomes sugared. Can, can you build, can you define, can a, like a user of the language define yeah. new sugars? So I imagine in the future, in the far future, you could define atom sugars for user types. So for example, more for like the end user side of things, maybe you'll have like a video timeline nominal type that you could define a custom UI for, but that's far away in the future. Currently it's all built in. Okay, so the next presentation in line is dark. Okay, great. Yeah, so a little, little bit myself. I did my PhD in Trinity College Dublin on uh, compilers and, and static analysis. Um, and then I'll skip some steps. I, I made Circle CI, so I was the CEO and founder of Circle CI and I ran it for the first four years and then took a break and I started Darklang in 2017. And more recently, things have been a little rough and we're currently in a trying to make dark good. It's not good yet. It has some interesting ideas. So yeah, why don't I give a quick demo of dark, but uh, before I do, I'll, let me just say the idea of dark and how we kind of ended with a structural editor. So the idea was you know, very similar to a lot of your programming is, is you know, much, much too, much too complicated. And so we identified a bunch of the complexity that's specifically involved in building backend web applications. So the sort of thing that you might build in you know, Ruby or Erlang or Go or Python or whatever, APIs running in the cloud basically. And the, the main areas of complexity that we came up with were the cloud complexity. So you know, having to get computers, that sort of thing. The deployment complexity, so getting code from somewhere into the cloud. And then the API complexity and sort of the, the syntax complexity were, were the other ones. And we ended up with a structured editor because part of getting that deployment down to zero and getting it running on our cloud is the idea that deployments are, are instant. And a structured editor is a much better form of doing that than you know, something that, that has maybe a parser across an entire code base or, or relies on you know, the existing things like GitHub and that sort of thing. So let me share a screen and do a very quick demo of Dark. So this is the Dark editor. You see it's a cloud editor and you can make HTTP endpoints very, very simply. So uh, here's a quick hello world and I will open that in a new tab and there it is. So this URL exists in the, you know, in production, in the cloud immediately, and people can go and hit that endpoint if they want. And one of the things that's most interesting about Dark, and this is the live programming feature, is that we have a, I call it trace-driven development. So this is the request that was just made by the browser. You can see the headers in particular, and we have a workflow that's built around making requests from your client, you know, a React or, or something like that, or, or mobile clients to our backend, and then you start to build your code from that. So here's one I built earlier. Here's a 404 that I made against the backend. And when I click the plus, I get that, but I also get the body of the request. And so I can type request.body. New email, and I see the actual email that a user, the actual request that a user made. So I can start to build up in a sort of a way deferred computation. I use the traces to write the program, and then they create more traces. And so an application ends up being built very much in tandem between the back end and the front end. You know, unlike how people do do that today, which you know, involves getting it into deployment or getting it into production via a pull request method. And, and that sort of thing. So that's roughly the main ideas of Dark. There's you know, the structural editing, there's it's a functional statically typed language, very much the way that you would expect and things like you know, testing and version control and that's all that sort of thing will be done you know, via this interface. And I think the kind of the final thing that's interesting about Dark is that every program that will ever be written in Dark will run on our infrastructure. And part of that is that we're taking on the burden of things like migrations and security and the cloud aspects of it. If we deprecate a function, we can change every user that has ever used that function onto a new function. So it's kind of trying to handle the, 
maybe the package manager complexity as well. Okay, so that was the four minutes. I don't know how I should announce that in, uh, or if Zoom has a feature. So does anyone have uh, questions? I was curious, is there any like on-prem deployment then? No, not, not at all. The, okay. the, the goal is, is very much designed around this sort of single ecosystem um, because it allows us to pull in much more of that complexity. You know, the, the last thing we want is, you know, we, we've got the, the world's easiest way to write an API, just, you know, install Kubernetes first. <laughs> okay, thanks. If you're also managing changing functions and deprecating them, how are you going to manage that when the user's code needs to be changed to adapt to the new function? Are you going to change everyone's code? Yes. So if we build a new standard library function, and we do this all the time, we version them and we deprecate the old ones. They stop appearing for the users in the autocomplete, only the, the undeprecated ones appear. We haven't built this yet, but yes, we intend to automatically migrate from old functions, old language features, that sort of thing by changing the user's code. So does this assume that the new function has the same behavior or like, what if the behavior changes? I mean, it, and... So take into account, obviously, you know, the signature and that sort of thing that there might be an AST manipulation that we want to do, perhaps it, you know, it's a result now and we need to do a pattern match or something, but it also takes into account that we are running the user's code. So we can do testing, we can, we can run the unit tests, we can, uh, you know, slowly migrate in production based on you know, are, do any errors suddenly occur uh, in their actual production load? So it's very much tied around the idea that we are running their production infrastructure as any of these changes happen. Alexander, you raise your hands, ask your question, but keep note, you can also ask it after. And uh, it was already more than two minutes for the question for Dark and or have Hazel and Rock and Frugal and Tyler ahead. And we want to give everyone their time. So, uh... Up to you. Oh, okay. It will be a quick note. With this approach, you create a vendor lock-in. Yes. It is not for everyone, but that is a property of the system. Cyrus or? Yep. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Cyrus. Uh, I am an assistant professor at the University of Michigan. I lead the Future of Programming Lab, so an academic effort here. I guess my story, I, I was a neurobiologist for a couple of years in grad school, and I got frustrated with the tooling that we were using to build brain models. And long story short, now I'm building structure editors. And uh, I've got a great group of students. I think two of them are here, David and Andrew. Do you, you guys want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm David. I... I moved around a lot in the States growing up. I studied computer science in high school or in, in college. And uh, after working for a couple of years, I wanted to do a yeah, PhD, started in uh, Boulder, Colorado before then uh, transferring to Michigan to continue working with Cyrus, who I'd started collaborating with when he was a postdoc. And it's just been a fun journey into the structure editor world. Hey, uh, I'm Andrew. So I'm a PhD student working with uh, David and Cyrus. Uh, right now I work mostly on structure editing mechanics and I studied automated programming assistance. Before then, uh, I worked on a uh, racket-based uh, structure editor called Fructure, uh, and uh, kind of the genesis of that is before being in CS, I was a math student, did most of my undergrad in math, and I kind of came up with the idea for this kind of like structured interaction math game. This is really before I had done any significant programming, I ended up designing on paper what I kind of later learned was like a structure editor for mathematics, but when I figured out this was a real thing that people worked on, I decided to pivot to CS, and that's how I ended up uh, where I am today. All right. And we've got Eric Griffiths is also working with us. He's not here right now, but he's uh, another PhD student. And then I will give a shout out to, there's been about 40 or so undergraduate contributors to these efforts that I want to acknowledge. So it's been really fun having that big group of contributors. So I will just do a demo. So I'll be talking about Hazel. There is this Tyler effort that David and Andrew are leading up as well. That's sufficiently different that I think it's worth it's, it's kind of its own little slot. Uh, so I'll focus on the Hazel effort. So Hazel, you can go to hazel.org and it's a web-based live functional programming environment. So what's different about Hazel, there's a few things. So one is that, uh, like I said, this is an academic effort. So we have a bunch of research papers that have a bunch of theory in them about all the different aspects of, of the system. So for example, the live program, actually, I think I brought this up. Um, 
So, you know, if you want to really understand how the live programming that I'm going to show you works, there's like a whole paper about that. So we really try to specify precisely what we're doing in this way. It's not necessarily the right thing for every project, but I think that is a unique kind of value that Hazel brings to the, the ecosystem. So you can go and click on um, play with Hazel up here. I'll kind of jump into an, a demo that I like to give. So you might've seen this before, but I think it demonstrates a lot of things that we're doing. So we're gonna implement Quicker functions. So if I start by defining Quicksort as a list of int to list of int function, uh, then it's a function that takes some input. I'm using tab to move between um, these holes, the holes have unique numbers, which you'll see comes in a little bit handy. So I'm going to pattern match, return the base case, and then I'm going to start doing the kind of recursive case, which is the interesting one, right? And then I'm um, quick sort algorithm. We sort of pick a pivot and we partition into kind of two lists, bigger and smaller. So I'll call partition. I have two holes I can move between. I can pull up this little type inspector to get uh, information about the type of each hole. So here, the partition function needs a predicate that compares, let's say, to the pivot, which let's say is the head element, and then we're partitioning the tail. So now we have this hole here in the return position of this function. And so if I look at this example that I give myself to develop with, it just returns hole 33. And so, you know, a second kind of unique aspect of Hazel is that we have this kind of maximally live evaluator. So it's running code, and it's actually not kind of stopping at holes. It's and you'll see that in a second, but it's actually computing these closures around holes. So if you look in the sidebar on the right, you'll see it's showing you the values of all of these variables that are in scope. So the tail was this, the head was this, and then these two partitions, smaller and bigger, were these. And if you kind of stare at these for a second, you'll see that I made a mistake. So, you know, I should have named this bigger and the smaller or done the comparison in the other direction because these numbers, these are not bigger, these are the bigger numbers. And so that's the proposition here is that you want to be able to evaluate a line of code right after you write it. So I can go and fix that. And then the next step would be to recursively sort these things. So you can see, first of all, I, you know, I have the correct values here now and I need to recursively sort them. So I'll do that. Get a pair here. And now you'll see I have Q, QS and QB, and these are recursive calls to this incomplete function. So they end up at hole 64 as well, but there are different instances of hole 64 because the runtime environment was different. So I can go and click on one of those and it changes the sidebar to show what the values were in that instance. And you can see that we've kind of recursed, broken down into these partitions, again, partitions working correctly and so on. So that's the idea here is you get feedback as you go along. Um, was that the out of time mark? Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. I'll just hint that there's another thing that someone can ask me about in the Q and A or something uh, where we have non-symbolic editing as well. So, but I'll, I'll respect the, the timer and stop there. Uh, so anyone has a question? Uh, I have a question. Yeah. What is non-symbolic editing? <laughs> is it cool if I give another quick demo of something? Yeah, if it's a short and answers the question, yeah, sure. Yeah, so so, um, so we have this Livelets project. So the idea is basically because it's a structure editor, you don't necessarily need to put in just kind of textual things. You can have things like sliders and color choosers and things like that. And what's kind of interesting about this example here is that the red, blue, and green components of this color are actually themselves Hazel expressions. So it's not that you go from code to GUI and then you're stuck in the GUI, you can actually go then back into code. And so this is actually doing some live computation here. So if I like change this slider, you're seeing this sort of trace of a semicircle in this color space here because I've set up this symbolic relationship between R, G, and B. It's sort of more green than red and blue basically here. You can also kind of nest sliders compositionally into the alpha channel here. And that enables all sorts of other interesting things. Like you can essentially implement a, a spreadsheet with proper formulas in, uh, in Hazel and stuff like that. So this, this system is called live literals or livelets. That's super cool. Thank you. Cool. So I think we can resume to rock now. Richard. Cool. Hello, uh, I'm Richard. So I'll start with a little intro of me and then also of Ayaz, who's here, who's also a Rock contributor. Um, and then I'll talk about the project a little bit. So I'm Richard. I was a professional web developer for, for a long time, a little over a decade. And then I got into Elm uh, at some point. I got really into Elm. 
I wrote the book Element Action for Manning Publications. Second book I've written. The first book I co-authored was Simon, actually. So hi, Simon. Um, I actually know a bunch of people here. <laughs> I've talked with Paul before and uh, Cyrus and others. So hello, folks. But yeah, so at some point I got into making a language because I wanted an Elm-like experience in other places. So today I work on Rock full-time. Uh, my employer, No Red Ink, pays me to work on it. We don't yet use it at work, but we're uh, planning to pretty soon once it's sort of far enough along. And uh, Ayaz is also uh, getting paid by his employer to work full-time on Rock. So I'll let him uh, introduce himself. Hey everyone, my name is Ayaz. I don't have nearly as on the backstory as some of you, so I'll just say I live in New York and I work on Rockford Richard. <laughs> cool. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm in Philadelphia. I guess I should have mentioned that too. Yeah, so uh, as far as the uh, the language and the editor go, the plan has been that the language has been designed with editing in mind from the get-go. However, it's also been intentionally designed to be able to work without an editor because of the fact that sort of unexpectedly now companies are paying us to work on it. We've ended up prioritizing recently more non-editor things because the companies want to like use it right away and, and are not as interested in the editor part. But all, all the companies that are sponsoring it are sort of like aware that the long-term vision is that like most of the value of the language is going to come through the editor, even though short-term just having a language with sort of like Elm-like semantics and ergonomics that can work in other contexts because Elm just compiles to JavaScript and is for UIs. Rock has a lot of a similar feel to Elm, but compiles to machine code uh, or to WebAssembly and can be used for like servers, command line apps and stuff like that. So definitely the target of the language is very much industry. This is not an academic project. It's not for research. It's more that we want to actually like apply stuff from research. And so like, I would love to do like all of the awesome stuff that we just saw demo and like Hazel among others, like uh, for real someday and like the, the rock editor and like have it be something that like people are using in their day jobs. That would make me super happy. So I'll demo some of the stuff that we do have. And I'll start with the editor demo just to demonstrate, like we do actually have an editor. It is such a work in progress that I literally can't demo it doing anything cool. It's like, you can like type some text in. It's like nominally structured behind the scenes, but like really it's not useful for like even like a, a full demo yet. We're super performance obsessed. So uh, one of the things that like Rock is like as a language is not only does it like compile really fast, the whole compiler is written in Rust. We're super like, interested in making it as fast as possible, but also the compiled output. We use LLVM for code generation, although also we have a separate development backend that goes straight to machine code or straight to WebAssembly, again, because of performance. So that way, when you're doing a development build, you can have the fastest turnaround time on compiled times. When you're doing a release build, you get you know LLVM's uh, suite of optimizations. I have a talk that I gave at Strange Loop called Outperforming Imperative with Pure Functional Languages, where we demo, I'm going to spoil that the end of the talk, but we actually demo um, doing quick sort, like vanilla textbook imperative, you know, style quick sort, but in a pure functional language, no cheats, no like special monads or anything. It's just like, we actually write it out recursively and we actually beat like uh, Java, JavaScript and almost, uh, well, anyway. Yeah. So several like very well-known imperative languages um, at quick sort when they got to do it, like with in-place mutation, because we actually optimized in-place mutation um, when possible. Anyway, so some things that are actually more interesting. This is our online REPL. This is all WebAssembly. So this is the rock compiler compiled to WebAssembly. And uh, when I type in an expression in here, this is actually compiling rock code on the fly to WebAssembly via our WebAssembly backend. So this actually is not using LLVM. This is all like straight rock directly to WebAssembly and then like uh, printing it out in there, uh, you know, stuff like that. You can uh, cat hello and world, you know, usual REPL stuff. Um, you can do all that. So, and then uh, last thing I'll demo uh, very briefly before we do questions, because I don't know how long we have left, but I know four minutes is not a lot of time. So this is something I'm actually giving a demo tonight at the uh, Houston Functional Programmers online meetup. I've written an application. It's like a little like load some data from an HTTP request, do some like transformations on it, and then write it out to a file. And basically I wrote this in Rock and also in Rust and also in TypeScript. And I sort of compare the three and like, you know, so you can sort of understand the language better. Um, or I, I should use future tense. I will be doing that later today. And one of the cool things from this demo is that uh, we have integrated testing. Like one of the things that is a goal for the language is to integrate a lot of the like modern tooling in general that people expect from projects. So that's not just editor stuff, but also testing. So there's this expect keyword. It just runs your tests. Like these are just inline tests essentially. So if I do rock test here, I think I just heard the timer go off. So this would be the end of the, end of the demo. If I just change this to blah and I run the test, uh, it will say expect failed. Cool. Um, and then also uh, another thing that's kind of interesting is that if I introduce a type mismatch, so I'm going to make this year be a, a string instead of a number. If I do rock check, it'll tell me, okay, you have a type mismatch, but I can also do rock test 
And even though I have a type mismatch in my program, it'll actually pass the other tests because they don't happen to hit this code path. And it just has an expectation failed saying like they crashed at runtime. So we actually mm -hmm. compile as much of the program as possible, kind of similar to Hazel. And then like the parts that we weren't able to compile, we generate like, okay, if you get to this code path, you'll uh, hit a runtime ex exception. Anyway, so uh, that's what we got uh, and love to answer any questions. You mentioned that you do uh, in place with re replacement where possible. Is the language using uh, linear types or something like that? No, so uh, it used to be using uniqueness types, but actually we switched to an alias analysis based on another project called Morphic, um, which I don't know if they have a paper out yet, but it's some UC Berkeley folks uh, who came up with this. But basically there's two things that we do. So one is um, our memory management system is reference counting. So Rock is really designed to be like easily embeddable in other uh, languages. Like that's how we kind of want to introduce it at work is like we have a big Rails backend that we want to migrate away from. And so uh, Rock doesn't have a virtual machine or anything. It just compiles down to like, Machine code basically compiles onto a C library, essentially. And uh, we do have automatic reference counting. So one of the ways we can do in-place mutation is if we're going to do something that semantically feels like a functional like clone in place, we can look and see if the thing we would be cloning and modifying happens to have a reference count of one right now. And if it does, great, we can mutate it in place. And then separately, we use Perseus as well as Morphic to do like static analysis of like, okay, do we know for sure that the reference count's going to be one here? If so don't even bother looking at it. We can just like allied reference counts and just be like, okay, this is definitely safe to mutate in place and no one will no notice the difference. So it's a pure functional language. There's no way to like directly express mutation. It's all done through optimizations. Cool. So now let's get to Frugal, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, Colin. So first a bit about myself, maybe. I'm Colin, I uh, just graduated from the Radboud University in the Netherlands. Um, my project was heavily inspired by Hazel. I actually worked a bit on Hazel for one of my courses. And for my master's thesis, I decided to do a project like that uh, myself uh, with some changes and different goals. So yeah, I think I'm just going to show a bit about that now. So I just jotted down some notes so you can read along here. So the the first thing I think was important when designing an editor is to think about editing existing programs before thinking about constructing a program from scratch, because Usually this editing operation is a bit more complicated and you can have the most amazing construction, uh, constructing operations, but then uh, but most of the time when you're programming, you're editing existing programs. So I, I think that's something important to, to think about. Then maybe some of the general design goals. I do not want to compromise on the flexibility and simplicity of traditional text editors. So. There's no tunneling problems or things like that. Secondly, I want to let structured information degrade granularly and uh, thus preserve sufficient information to enable IDE features that depend on ASDs in all editor states, quite similar to Hazel. And then the capabilities of these IDE features and the information they provide, they degrade granularly along with the ASD. And the third, major design goal is to have no unexpected editor states or other unexpected consequences of using IDE features. And a concrete part of this is that IDE features do not guess at the programmer's intent by trying to fix or prevent syntax or type errors, because it's just impossible to know the programmer's intent and you will guess wrong and be annoying to the programmer, basically. And then the second sub goal of this is that the editor and IDE features are transparent about lack of structure in, uh, or information in some places. So the user can actually expect degraded uh, structure and information in the IDE features. And also there's no use of still information from previously, uh, previous and possibly more structured editor states in IDE features that change the program because that also just gets in the way in my experience. And if any stale information is displayed, then it should be clearly marked as such, but I don't really have any of this at the moment, just uh, the vision for the system. If you note that I didn't achieve all these goals because there are some edge cases where it's not 
completely as simple as a text editor or where the an IDE feature does guess a little bit at the program's intent. But this is all mainly because I want to do a live evaluation because I think it's one of the best ways to make programmer programming easier uh, in general at the moment. So I also implemented this in the in Frugal. Some notable features are it's completely automatic and the provided runtime information is based on the cursor location, quite similar to Hazel. I think that's the timer, so I'll... Colin, I'll, uh, I'll direct a question for you because I'm a bit confused, so I'll just ask and uh, you tell me if that uh, explains what you're doing. So basically what sets Frugal aside is that you can completely write any character anywhere you write to do like free text editing, just like a normal text editor, and then it figures out what is part of an AST and what is not. And this is the process of degradation where it was an AST and it's not anymore. Yeah, that's correct. That's the main distinguishing feature of the editor, at least. Are there any other questions? I have a quick question. So these AST nodes, are they uh, are they didn't based on the grammar, for example, like are they like do they correspond to the non-terminals that on the left hand side of a a grammar, or is this something that you're you, you've been kind of like patching together as you're going right now? And then if I understand you correctly, they do correspond to grammar rules. Mm -hmm. um, so you could you could view the you could view construction sites as strings of like terminal and non-terminal. Okay, yeah. it's like in yeah. the grip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. <clears throat> yeah, I um I've been thinking of very similar things. Or we we've been thinking very similar things. Yeah. And um yeah, so I'm excited to talk more. Yeah. So uh David, uh, you wanted to present Tyler. Uh, I think you can uh, take it from here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so this is Tyler, so sort of an offshoot project from uh, I was originally working on the Hazel project, and then we decided to kind of distill some of the editing ideas that we've been working on separately from the type and live evaluation concepts of Hazel. And so similarly to Frugal, we're also trying to go for a very text-like experience. Yeah, so let's just see. I'll just show you Tyler in action here. So here's a little function that where... The idea is that it's going to return a circle object that goes through some two-dimensional point through that center and goes through a point P. And so the first thing I might do is compute a radius. And so as soon as I type this let token, the matching tokens equals an N are put into what's called Tyler's backpack here. And so the backpack, the basic idea of the backpack is that it represents your syntactic obligations that you are expected to meet before your program can be sort of considered complete again. And the backpack is automatically filled and automatic is automatically filled and uh, sort of discharge like the obligations are discharged as I type. So if I now go and compute a square root function, open a parentheses to start a function application and I have the matching in parentheses here and you'll see it continues to grow and shrink as I type. Uh, and let me just wrap that up. And so all of that was done with exactly the same keyboard input as you would use in a text editor. Now, the, I think there's been a lot, generally a lot of attention focused on text-like entry on in structure editors. But another aspect we're really thinking about is how we can restructure existing code. And I think this was a, a focus shared by Frugal as well. And so like one, I think one particular issue with with structure editors is that often if you're editing the trees, you, when you're selecting things, you're kind of restricted to the complete trees. And so when you, if you're projecting those trees to this kind of textual form, it can feel kind of jarring and restrictive to have to select say this entire let expression instead of say, just selecting this let binding here, but here in, ooh, what's going on there? Um, well, but anyway, in, in any case here in Tyler, like one of the ideas we're exploring is the idea of being able to disassemble or serialize structures into their projected components. 
and be able to kind of operate on those partial structures and then provide some sort of guidance and um, assistance to make sure that the way you put those partial structures back together, you still have a valid tree at the end. So let me just like show an example. Like let's say I want to extract this, these two let lines and this square root into a reusable distance calculation function. So I'll um, start just typing out here. And then I'm gonna go over here, take these, put that there. Take this, hmm. Seems like some new bugs have appeared. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, and so, yeah, that's, the, that's sort of what the experience looks like. Um, using uh, Tyler to perform that refactor. Um, and so, yeah, again, we're trying to get as close to this kind of linear text-like editing experience as possible. Yeah, and I'm happy to take any questions. That's super cool. Is there a place we can try this out? Yeah, actually you could, yeah, you can try this out now. So like um, right now the URL so tyler.fun, this is an iteration of a, an earlier project that if you just go to tyler.fun, you'll see an older, much smaller version of this. But if you, we have a bunch of different branches at different sub URLs. So you can actually, yeah, if you go to study 2022 June, we, we ran a user study recently on this. You can uh, try it out yourself. Very cool. Thank you. And a quick I, question. Sorry, go ahead. When you're typing, there's like a bracket that's either left facing or right facing. And yeah. I've been trying to decode <laughs> when it switch. Is it just whenever you do a closing sort of element, it switches direction? Okay, so like if I were to delete this opening parentheses here, this closing paren needs a opening parens to complete it. And then correspondingly, if I delete this, this will be in the backpack with this highlighted. Yeah, David, I think he's talking about the tips on the the carrot yeah yeah just the mm -hmm. cursor itself it like oh it... see i see yeah so what we're so each of these structures are being like e each token kind of has like angled tips that are either convex or concave and they indicate whether or not they expect another argument on that side so like this in this case with the function application parentheses it's concave on both sides because it's expecting the function on the left and then the first argument on the right. But if I were to delete this, there's like a kind of remolding system here that remolds that to be convex here. So yeah, there is some like internal parsing going on to or uh, to yeah change those shapes. Thanks. Yeah. The um, this is like really beautiful in in like a very subtle way. And, and I wonder kind of, kind of what, what affordances have you put into that sort of like design to, to make it so? You know, I mean, I, I, so I think like the particular, like, yeah, subtle color scheme, we can thank Andrew for that. Andrew has been doing a lot of amazing sort of visual design aspects here, especially the backpack stuff. I'm um, really happy with how the, the sort of like stack based kind of, uh, oops. Hmm, what's happening there? Let's say I do this and you know, you have this kind of like these bubbles going out. I, yeah, it's something that we've been iterating on for quite some time now. And we actually have some more thoughts moving forward about how, like right now, like the backpack is kind of tied with the, like we're using the backpack as a clipboard that you can, where you can select things and put things in there. Um, we're actually thinking now we should just start to sort of divorce that from the backpack um, and just have the backpack be sort of this derived completion menu for you. Yeah, sorry, I don't, that kind of went up, kind of went on a tangent there. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, sure, thanks. Um, yeah. I'll just give a general now. So yeah, we presented all the different projects participating in this meeting. And now it's the open-ended questions and answers slash discussion panel time. Anyone who wants to ask something either general to everyone or we can still discuss specific stuff. Yeah, I think- I have I a, a question, which I guess is like partly a topic. Mm -hmm. um, 
So uh, I've talked to some of you here about this, um, but I'm kind of curious now that we have a larger group just to hear what different people's perspectives and opinions are. Um, so it seems like we're all in agreement that structured editing is like awesome, but I've also heard mixed reviews about when you actually have like someone who's like a real end user who's used to a non-structured editor using it for the first time or even after they've been using it for a while, um, running into like, you know, ergonomics problems or, or like, you know, complaining about the experience or whatever. Um, I'm very interested in, uh, and like, it seems like Tyler's approach is really cool here, um, about this sort of space of how do we get the semantic benefits of structured editing without having a user experience that people end up complaining about in practice, where they feel like this is just an upgrade. It's not like, you know, uh, yes, there's pros and yes, there's cons, but like, they're just like, no, this is great. Why, why isn't everything like this? Um, so I don't personally have like hands-on experience of like having built a structured editor and trying it out on people. I've just heard this from different people, some of whom are here, but I'd love to just hear the experiences of um, like different experiences of like people who are here, like what's worked, what hasn't, um, you know, uh, like what are your thoughts on like how we can do this well um, and, and create an experience where like you have all the semantic benefits without any of the UX concerns. So with with Dark, we've had a couple of thousand people, you know, sign up and, and try out the the um, the structured editor. Um, it has not been universally well received. Um, in in general, it's 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 not super well received. Like writing code with it, I think generally feels good and editing code usually feels bad, which uh, I think Colin talked about in, in his presentation. That, that was really interesting. Um, but I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that structured editing is, uh, you know, is a thing that should feel better. I think, I think it's a thing that's like going to be roughly the equivalent and the benefits are, are sort of around it, kind of in the way that, that Unison is, is focusing on, on the tooling that you get when you have it. Um, as opposed to um, thinking that like like text is bad, right? There's a lot of things that are bad about text. I think we can accept that there's a lot of things that are going to be bad about structural editing as well, and that we're trading off one versus the other. Um, yeah, I, I see some hands up, but I just wanted to to note one thing, and I think Paul, you may have told me this specifically, is that one of the things that um, and correct me if I'm wrong on this that specifically people don't like about editing is where you want to make the type of edit where temporarily the AST is broken. Like you mm -hmm. have like two strings and you want to put your cursor before the open quote of the second string and press backspace a bunch of time because you want to combine the two strings together. Yeah. But it, yeah, it needs to be temporarily broken in order to do that operation. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, I, I've been, I've been, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, complete, complete your, I, I would just uh, complete the arts, but just now let's try to uh, follow you up with, uh, I think Chris and Boaz and uh, myself and David raised hand and Andrew to also answer on the same questions. And uh, I think we're sorted by the order of raising hands uh, by uh, Zoom's interface. So finish and uh, Chris will follow you. Yeah, I, I, I've been finding a lot that every time I'm doing that sort of textual refactor, um, it's, it's a situation in which I'm doing an actual structured refactor, but because of the syntax of, of the program, I'm, I'm forced to do this sort of like ugliness. So for example, um, I'm, I'm changing something at the moment where, where there's a lot of let ands and I'm changing them to a place where they need to be lets. And so I need to change the word and to the word let, but if I was doing a, you know, more formal refactor where I was extracting the the editor would know to do that. Um, and I, I think the vast majority of things that, that, that we try to do with this kind of come into the, um, you know, a, a, re, a refactor action would give, would give a better outcome, um, to, but just people don't have it for regular text editing and they're not familiar with it. So they, they get stuck in, in that mode. Um, yeah, with regard to kind of this divide that we have between text editors and, and these visual editors, I think there's a, there's a lot of different factors at play here. And I think it's also worth uh, for us to consider, I think a lot of these editors, uh, we notice as we, we talk about them, each of them is paired with a language, right? And 
that makes you know the idea of structured editing just uh, a monolithic effort right because you have to design a language and then you have to design your editor around that language and then you know uh i think we can agree that it makes it much more difficult for this to actually get into you know average industry programmers hands so i'd be really curious and interested if there's some subset of the structured editing uh, benefits that could be distilled down and maybe integrated into something like maybe the language server protocol uh, so that all editors can benefit from some aspects of the structured editing. For instance, you know, Tyler's backpack, I could see that being something that could be added to the language server protocol. And then you now get the structured editing benefits in Scala, in Golang, in C, um, without you know, every single language needing to design their own editor as well. Uh, so I, I don't think you would ever reach the same level of beauty that, that we can get from a dedicated structured editor, but I would definitely be interested in seeing which aspects of structured editing uh, dovetail nicely with an editor already uh, that we could, uh, you know, start to integrate, uh, for instance, language server protocol. I, I actually wanted to ask the exact same question up to the, like, including the, the point of using uh, the language server protocol. I think with the uh, approaches that we saw today, uh, there is a very tight binding between the projectional editing approach and the language and, the, and like the, the type system mainly. Uh, but back in the day when I, uh, when this was an active research uh, avenue for me, I, I, I thought, I had a few thoughts about how this can be done. I, I don't know, if, like, it's not, I don't have a definite answer and it's not, uh, uh, I don't think that it's very, um, it, yeah, the, the, there, there is no clear answer, and I, I, like I want to, like I'll be happy to also hear other people's thoughts. Um, okay, I, I want to stay on the on the question of uh, structural editing not being uh, fun for people who want to make text edits. Um, so I think Frugal does solve it completely because it gives you like an exact text editing experience at the expense of some more uh, fancy editor features that, uh, for example, in Lambda, we don't want to give up. So it really just becomes a very, very difficult UX and uh, implementation problem. Um, and yeah, none of the projects I tried, uh, including Lambda, are perfect here. Uh, but it's improving gradually by feeling a, a bit more and more like normal text editing. But the benefits you get by not allowing uh, invalid states, I think, beat the drawbacks. Uh, like one of the biggest ones is the interface for type errors, which uh, it's like leaps and bounds uh, over what you have in any textual language, which changes the trade-off. And currently people argue whether you should use static types or not, and whether you should have type inference or not, but I think this opens the door to change the trade-offs completely. And even though there are drawbacks to not being complete text editing, I think the benefits outweigh it. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add, um, um, so I, I, I personally think, yeah, I, I, that we should try to, you know, support the, you know, kind of uh, text editing things and do all the messy things that people might want to do in particular because that's the structure that 
people are seeing, right? Like they're they're being shown a textual serialization of the program. And I mean, you can, you know, add more visual indications, like structural indications, like in a block-based editor. Um, but even then, like it can be quite restrictive to have to always operate directly on those structures and not ha have, an, have a way of say, like taking a block and just moving one part of the block. Like in, an, in vector graphic editors, right? You have, you can draw a box and you can also just grab an edge and drag it around, right? Uh, independently of the other edges. And I think structure editors should also have similar like partial structure, like uh, manipulations. And I think that's that's a big part of the 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 problem that people encounter with when when faced with the structure editor. They're they're forced to operate on these trees that may or may not be shown to them. Um, and uh, you have to do this whole like game of Towers of Hanoi to like try to get like trees from to move trees from one to the other. And like, <clears throat> and so I so I think Frugal and Tyler are taking a very similar approach where we're we're saying that you know uh, you, you you shouldn't the structures that you're operating on shouldn't have to be complete trees, right? There there are substructures that are interesting and like can be analyzed. Like you can break down if if I have uh, if I if, if I open a parentheses and start typing out some stuff in the middle and I haven't put down that other closing parens, there's still stuff in that in that middle that is structured in a certain way um, that can be, and you once you put that on the parentheses, maybe you gain some incrementally more structure, you gain incrementally more structure, but there there is still something there. And I think that, 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 that so like the problem is that we're, we're like assuming, we, we, we have been assuming that the only two structures that we can act on are text or trees, right? But there is this there is this continuum in the middle of like the the partial non-terminals, the partial reductions that uh, that you know maybe are sequenced together and uh, can be analyzed by our system. So I think yeah, I mean we've been like thinking about how like what so like how do how exactly do you catalog all of those little like discrepancies um, in like how exactly do you catalog that like um, that continuum? Um, so like in Tyler, like one, like some of those uh, issues, some of those like inconsistencies are uh, handled by like these little placeholder holes that are either like convex or they're concave kind of indicating either there's a tree expected here that is not there. So you have zero instead of one, or you have multiple things where you expect one thing and that's where the concave kind of like placeholders come into place saying there's something here that here that's necessary to connect these two things to into one uh, one tree node and um, and similarly the backpack is saying that I, or, yeah um, I guess like yeah they, so like the philosophy we've been sort of arriving at here is that like you should you should permit the you know whatever edit that the person wants to make but show them the show them the completions or show them the sources of incompleteness that lead that uh, prevent them from that that make this an incomplete program and then provide some way provide some guidance in terms of, in terms of textual editing that uh, bring them to the complete parse. Uh, yeah, so I mean, David covered most of the stuff I wanted to talk about, but just kind of to, to drive home a couple of points. Like, I really feel like uh, in the issue of like structured uh, structured editing versus like fluid text editing experience people are more familiar with, like, I really feel like there's not like a definitive uh, like goal point on that spectrum, but rather like there's a variety of use cases, both between projects and between activities within one particular uh, development environment. In which you might want some like more structured rails uh, than others, because like it's not just about like I mean like uh, this kind of like substructure editing or partial structured editing that David's talking about. It's not just about editor services, but it's also about getting confused too. I mean like in text editing, you can do any kind of edits, but like you can get into states where like oh like what's going on? Like I can't tell what's part of what uh, any anymore. And if you're an advanced editor, like maybe that's not a big deal. Like maybe you're willing to deal with kind of the cognitive burden of being in these states. But if you're a beginner or you're just tired, uh, maybe you don't. So kind of like the way that, that we're trying to go is think, yeah, like more broadly about this continuum of possible states or rather like 
what invariants do you want to preserve uh, while you're editing? And then perhaps for certain editing modes, you want to be uh, more strict about what you preserve. And just to mention, this doesn't even have to be restricted to, to syntax as such. I mean, you can think about this as extending into like the type uh, regime or even like the value regime too, where like maybe you want to click in a pure refactoring mode where like either it preserves type, every action you can perform preserves types or even preserves uh, uh, the, 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 the results of certain tests. So, I mean, this can kind of be like a broad spectrum approach uh, to editing where you can select in, in, in a particular session uh, what aspects, what invariants are, are, are you interested in preserving. And just to touch briefly on, on, on a point that some other people made about like uh, language server protocols, et cetera. Like it's like, it, it's an interesting question and definitely something we've been exploring in Tyler, like what you've seen uh, so far with Tyler, it, it is uh, language agnostic, at least in a loose case, like there is like one single file that is basically a BNF grammar that determines your language. And if you edit stuff there, uh, yeah, you change the language that you're editing. We don't support the the full uh, like set of uh, of operations. Like we can't do arbitrary uh, context free grammars at the moment, but we're really kind of working towards that state. So like the Tyler uh, focus, as opposed to the Hazel focus, as such, is we would like to bring some of these features uh, to you know your everyday languages. So you, you might try integrating it with uh, with tree sitter, which is a lot of a uh, lot of traction on, on on that sort of thing. Um, so going back to the um, to to the sort of structured editing uh, question, and you know, allowing people to edit edit existing things, I, I I think that we need to discuss the context of why the user is making the edit. Um, so different languages that 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 we've been discussing, different editors have have different purposes, but for dark, it's it's very much there is a program that exists in production that is in use by not only our users but their users. So you know they they have clients that are written in let's say React that are talking to the HTTP server that is backing the program that that a dark developer is looking at, and they want to change that program. So going in and out of syntactically valid. Um, I'm not sure, like, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a thing that, that, that people are doing. I'm not sure that, that it's a thing that we necessarily want to support too well, you know, versus putting a feature flag on a particular expression and letting people atomically switch between one and the other. And I think that there's a lot of power to that atomic switch and choosing who gets to see old code versus new code. And when you end up in this you know the, the the transitional state between two valid syntaxes there isn't a lot of support for you know kind of what is the the what is actually happening in the semantics of the program like if the semantics of the program that is you know the, this sort of like incomplete program that that many of us allow to execute um if that becomes too confusing then we we, we haven't we haven't done our user of service either at least in in our context, but I'm sure some others have a similar kind of contextual basis in in, in, in which the editing becomes really important or how the editing is done becomes important. William, you're next in line if you want to uh, answer. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm suddenly next. I thought I had one more. Um, the uh, the one uh, facet of uh, of textual versus structure editing that I wanted to uh, remind us all of is uh, in a textual editor, like if you're doing something serious, half of your time is just like is spent just like searching around through your code base to who references what and how do they interact with each other. And um, and so I feel that is a really important use case that uh, that structural editors certainly can support strongly. IDEs sometimes do this better or worse. Uh, and it's just uh, it's just what comes to mind when I'm like, well, what does an editor let you do? Well, it lets you easily get around, um, you know, something where you've got lots of definitions that are interacting and across a whole number of layers of uh, of an application where you've got cross references and so forth that you're tracing down and and hunting around um I, and so i think that's a uh that's a place where where we uh where attention should be directed uh, once you get to any 
any scale whatsoever, you're going to be navigating around your code base more than uh, more than uh, more than you'd like sometimes, and and more than is uh, and more than is easy. And I think uh, I think coming to so that was that was the big point is um, navigation around a code base is super interesting, and important, and people pick their editors because they're good at doing that activity. I feel. Um, and then um, the second point is people pick editors because they get to pick whatever editor that they like to use for a thing. And so the kind of person most likely interested in a structured editor is someone who's used to say an IDE that does a lot of handholding, like, like has a lot of commitments versus um, the, uh, the uh, Vim Emacs crew who are like, well, I've got my editor and it does the thing I like and the way I like it and I got it all set up for just me personally and I don't want you messing with me. Um, so it's you have to look at your audience when you're deciding if a structure editor is right for them or if they're in a uh, position to be open to structured editing, if they're um, sort of used to living in their, in their in their world where they control how all of their editor works, they will find someone else's structure editor, you know, upsetting because it doesn't do it the way they like to do a thing. Um, and so that's always how you have to understand um, um, a user of your system is, well, where are they coming from? What expectations do they have? How much are they willing to uh, give up control for something new? And how eager are they to learn? Well, this structure editor, lets you do these kinds of transformations nicely, but you have to learn them because, I mean, there's always a, a um, learning curve and people who've been developers for a long time may have forgotten that it took them forever to learn how to do all the minute stuff that they, that's just built into their fingers now with their, with their editor of choice. And so trying something new, they'll of course be frustrated because it doesn't work right. So those are the two thoughts. Um, okay, so um, Colin uh, asked about what I said about how I think that while Frugal does let you have uh, an environment that behaves just like text, it's something that I don't exactly want. And one thing I can say that working in C++ in Xcode, I already have an environment that doesn't behave like text, and sometimes it annoys me. Uh, but Apple made the decision to like complete stuff for you in uh, ways that they found, I guess, to be more useful than being exactly a text editor. Um, and I, I don't know if it's a real worry, but I think if it can be like too much of it unstructured, then there are a lot of services that uh, won't be available. Uh, and it would be like an inconsistent experience. I'll just show a really simple example. So, um, yeah, um, I wrote, I'm filtering the numbers from one to a thousand then checking which ones divided by three. And I get the sum of it and I can, like everything basically is valid and gets the services of running and also I can, which I wouldn't have known how to do if it was free text, I can switch to like seeing it in uh, Italian or uh, Hebrew, which is right to left, so it doesn't matter. Um, and like the key one, which is most important, I think is uh, the experience with type errors. So if I have uh, the fact that the editor is, um, knows which, what was valid before and assigns the error here. In contrast to if I wrote text here and five here, the error would be assigned to here. Is afforded by having everything as uh, it's possible valid all the time. And uh, yeah, so the editor knows how to mark the new thing as invalid. And if too much is like in the free form text or there's too much invalid parts that live independently. I don't know if it would uh, bring the same value, but uh, I'm not sure, maybe it would. Yeah, you're definitely right. Um, if like 
if you have a text. So Trudel doesn't like allow you to store text on the file system at all at the moment. But if you would store uh, your program as a text file and there's syntax error and you would try to reload it, the only thing Prudel can do is show it as a giant construction site or like non-empty hole, and then you have no IDE features whatsoever. Um, and even when you open a parentheses but don't close it yet and you start typing a bunch of stuff, then the editor also won't know about the inner, uh, like the, about the structure of the thing between parentheses uh, because it can't complete uh can make a you know, that it's a C node of it yet and uh, because of the missing parentheses which is like really um a, a thing of does the writing uh programs uh maybe less well than the editing part but um yeah so yeah you're definitely right about that um i also want to respond a little bit to the um making it work for uh, existing languages or uh, IDEs um because I, I think there are general things that you can do and it sounds like Tyler is also already doing this um by making the general editor algorithm language agnostic and this is something I've done with uh, Frugal as well and I really see it being implemented in like a language server um which uh, lets you kind of reap the benefits of preserving some of the structure of the program while editing um without uh hindering the user in any way because it's still you can still type in the editor in the standard text editor like normal um yeah i think that's really interesting way of um yeah making this uh like <laughs> letting us have these nice things we can get from structure editors before we have a feature complete editor and language uh that everyone uses yeah um i think that was it Um, yeah, so so I I actually think there is a a, a, a tension between allowing these um, partially structured um, uh, editor states and um, the sort of continuous live semantic availability that many editor services would rely on. Um, I think a critical thing to manage that is to make sure that the um, the effect of a you know, a break of structure should be localized in some way, right? So you can put a, a box around the part of the um, the program that has that problem. And I think David was, was talking a little bit about this. And as you fix it, you get more structure, but you don't lose all structure as soon as there's a syntax error, which is the state of affairs of just plain text editing. Um, now, you know, often the part of the code that your cursor is on is the part of the code that's partially broken. So it's sort of the worst place to lose editor services. So I think that's a really interesting challenge, right? Is um, providing services at the cursor where that's the place where things are most broken. Um, and I think we have some ideas there, but I think there's a lot more that we can, we can do with that. Um, I wanted to ask a new question, but I see David also raised his hand. Uh, and if it's about this topic, I let you come first. Um, yeah, I, I guess I just wanted to, um, yeah, go, going back to this, uh, the tension of losing structure and um, like, you know, sort of losing the benefits of that. I mean, it does seem, uh, I, again, it feels to me like, um, part of the problem is that parsing like like given in the given this dichotomy of text and like sort of nicely formed trees um when you lose structure you 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 go so far down this structural continuum such that you now you just have this string of tokens and there's really little that you can say 
But I think if you do introduce, you know, this, like if you do have uh, sort of, well, like maximal structure that is possible, like on everything around, like everything, um, you know, up to the point of this syntactic, like this, you know, say like this parentheses is missing its matching component. Um, my my feeling is that there there are there there's space to explore analyses or you know sort of meaningful semantic analyses that can still help you in this state. It doesn't have to be a sort of binary like on or off uh, situation. Um, and so I yeah I I I'm curious about I I guess I'm yeah I'm pushing back on like Paul's point here about like losing too much like uh, when you. Um, when when you go through these those syntactically invalid states, I think there there's just unexplored space in terms of the kind of editor assistance you can provide. That uh, it just needs to broaden its perspective on the structures that they're that they're analyzing. All right, I, I want to uh, raise a new uh, topic, um, which is. Um, so I know that dark in unison, if I understand correctly, currently allow you to change a library function and have code depending on it using the old implementation, or they migrate by default when the type signature doesn't change, but then uh, hold off migration. Uh, to when it does change, which is a bit similar to what Lambda does, but Lambda doesn't let you run it a different version. It's like it would mark that the migration is needed. And uh, actually, Richard, I listened to your recent podcast today, and uh, you said that uh, code that should change together and doesn't sometimes introduces bugs which I think is like the main reason maybe for not allowing it. Uh, yeah, so I wonder, uh, mainly dark and unison, but everyone, what are your thoughts about this? Yeah, so um, what, what dark allows is, um, just functions to be versioned and um, we, we we don't do content addressing in in, in the way that um uh that, that that unison does uh i think i think you know the the reason for for those two approaches are sort of down to what we're actually trying to accomplish with the thing so if you if you look at what unison is trying to do they, they've got the distributed system where they're trying to like you know distribute programs in you know, immutably partially um Whereas what, what we're trying to do is to have this sort of like, you know, one big system. Um, and so a, a um, you know, uh, incremental versioning just work, works totally fine for us. So that the, there's a new version of a function that doesn't have the same bug uh, in it. We don't want to change anything that's happened before. So we give you a new version and you can opt to, to switch over to it and there's there will soon be built-in refactoring that will allow you to switch into it on an individual basis. Um, and so I, I, I think I think the the need for this is all sort of like derived from how do we imagine users running programs long term on on our systems? Yeah, uh, to speak from from Unison's uh, side of that perspective. Um, I don't think usually the intention uh, would be that you would, you know, forget, you know, you would change the, the root definition and then you would change half of the rest of your code base and then leave the other half depending on an old version. Uh, you certainly could do that if you really wanted to, but uh, the, the way Unison typically works with this is uh, if you do have a type preserving edit that you make, uh, typically, you do want that to propagate everywhere, right? Code that changes should should propagate, um, and Unison can handle that for you automatically. But if there is a type changing edit uh, in a traditional editor, right? You would, you know, let's say break uh, function foo, and now you try to compile, and you just get errors everywhere, right? And you can't really do anything until you go through all of these compile errors and 
fix all of them. And it's not even so easy because you might get one compile error and then you fix that compile error and then you get three more compile errors and then you fix those three and then you get five more and then you, you know, you propagate out and uh, you thought you were going to be done by lunch and it takes till supper, right? So what Unison does instead in that scenario is it says, okay, I can actually analyze your dependency tree and I can say, by making this type breaking change, you will now need to update you know, these 10 locations. Uh, and if you're able to correct those in a type preserving way, right, then we can auto propagate up the stack from there. As soon as you've handled the, the type breaking change, we can handle the rest. Uh, and it collects all of those changes for you in a to do list. We call it an edit frontier. So when you do make one of these type breaking changes, it'll actually guide you through the refactor to ensure that you don't forget to update anything, um, which, which I think is probably a nice way to handle that. And if you do want to explicitly, you know, continue to depend on the old version, you can certainly do that. Uh, but, but you're not gonna forget to, to update something that depends on it. Um, so just to provide a different, uh approach that gives similar benefits. Um, uh, I don't know, Paul, did you raise your hand first? You want to go first? Uh, sure, sure. Um, thank you. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the thing, uh, the, the way that, that, that I think that we should think about this, um, these changes to libraries is, is to look at the broader ecosystem and think about what happens when someone releases a new, a new package on NPM. Right. There are tens of thousands of downstream users of, of this package and something might have changed in the package. It's very hard to tell what has changed. Some functions might have changed, some types might have changed. There's a minor version, kind of doesn't mean anything. Uh, maybe it's a major version. You know. and, so, and so you, you sort of have to, have to take into account what is it that changes here and who is going to, who wants to change their code and how safe do they want to be with it? So for example, you might take a, uh, you know, let's call it a microservice. You know, you, you might take a microservice that, that is less important and you might migrate it to the new version of a package, or you might take, um, you, you might uh, deploy a new version of your code to only 1% of users uh, in order to get some sort of um, some safety uh, or belief in, in safety uh, of the change. And so I think that we're not really just dealing with migrating from one function to another um, or you know, from one type safe state or one parsable state to, to, to another state. There's, there's a, a very, uh, th th this, this sort of a time frame with which users are gonna make those changes. And sometimes that, that time frame is years. Um, between one package and another. And I think that, that that is something that we have to we have to take into account. We're not just like, you know, switching from version zero to version one. Right. Um, so I would say that the same experience uh, that uh, that was described before uh, in on uh, Unison that Chris you described, uh, you you have something similar. Uh, in Lambda without allowing different versions of the same function to run. Uh, so basically uh, the each top level declaration is saved with the types of the dependencies that it used at the time the user used them. And when there's a discrepancy, it still does type checking or inference with the old types, but it shows you that it needs to update. And it also has like the to-do to help you update whatever needs updating. And it's just that uh, Eyal mostly said a hard no on the solution, but by like referring to the old function, he said, he's concerned that it's a source of bugs. I can't uh, elaborate uh, his reasoning for it, but I trust his uh, our Eyal. Um, yeah, I, sorry, I can't open my camera right now. I didn't raise my hand, but since you mentioned me, uh, <laughs> I'll uh, take the liberty to expand a little. Um, I, I, I don't know, I, I don't feel it's a very hard no in the sense that I do think we are open to 
to being convinced of almost anything. When you have, imagine you have a, a bunch of functions and, and their semantics are coupled in some way. Um, maybe uh, changing one uh, updates the way some persistent data structures are, are written, uh, and another is updating the way they are read in a backwards compatible way. So if you change only one and not the other, uh, everything can break. So that's just one example. So you might want to you want to you might want to change atomic in the whole group. Um, and so leaving old uses uses of old functions all over the code base um, and allowing that to run at least implicitly sounds to me like a potential for big problems. Uh, I deal mostly with long running systems and not with uh, request handlers. Uh, so a localized problem can have devastating global uh, effects. Um, but I guess in different domains, it can, uh, the damage can be more localized and then the trade-offs are uh, kind of different. Cyrus? Yeah, so, so um, a lot of this discussion about uh, versioning makes a lot of sense if you're deploying things to customers and, and you're really worried about um, uh, breaking other people's code. Um, but there's another attitude that I think is an interesting one that isn't explored enough, which is you embrace things being a little bit broken all the time. Um, so imagine, you know, I like to do this thought exercise with some of the students of like, imagine a program the size of Wikipedia that thousands of people are editing Google Docs style all the time, right? You, you can put a lot of infrastructure in to make it so that the entire thing is completely error free at all times. But what if we just allow errors to kind of be valid things inside the system? And sometimes you notice that weird things are happening with your code and it gives you some services to go and see why that's happening. Oh, this other person's editing this library I depend on. And maybe that's an opportunity to go talk to them, right? Maybe that's an opportunity to go figure out what they're doing and if it makes sense for me. Um, I don't think this is the right attitude for like really, you know, critical customer facing things like I do think I, I'm glad to see all the cool work with unison and, and, and dark and all these things but also I think it's like a fun thought exercise to be like what if we embrace things being broken all the time I, I want to uh, raise maybe a, I'm not sure it's a hundred percent related uh, tangent relates to what uh, Paul was saying before uh, about updating packages from npm uh, so the way I see it, uh, I hope like there's no real concept of uh, packages, like all the code is together in the one super Wikipedia giant GitHub thing and stuff works on a global definition granularity basis. So, uh, uh, and I suppose you have branches where you merge a bunch of someone's changes to a lot of uh, functions at once. Maybe that is similar to an NPM update. Uh, yeah, but uh, I hope, yeah, that, never mind. So, yeah, Cyrus, um, the, this idea of, of everything being broken all the time is, is what we're talking about with, with function versioning, because you know we, we've got something that's broken in in the old version of it, and we've got you know an exception comes in or you know some, something uh, comes in where a user gets a five hundred, and we go talk to those users, and we, we we do that now already, right? You know we've got we've got these different deployments and these different microservices, and you know pull requests being made on GitHub. So I, I think I think we do have a a this. Where, where everything is constant broken, everything is constant in flux. And what we're sort of you know advocating for or, or, or what we're what what we propose via these these like typed version functions is is you know essentially 
a unit where a new thing can go out in a small granular way that that we can you know slowly edit the article to being better while acknowledging that all the rest of it is, is a hellscape Maybe everything has to be broken all the time, regardless of what approach you take. Either it's broken because you're using the old version or it's broken because the new version's in development, right? So maybe things, maybe that attitude needs to be embraced regardless. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that the, um, you know, sort of, sort of the, the concept of type safety only really exists because we're, we're only type safe on our computers, right? We, we aren't type safe when we, you know, bundle it into Docker containers and throw it up on, on AWS. Um, and so maybe what we're doing really is, is trying to extend that notion of type safety to, to, you know, a larger part of our actual program. Um, just a general note, um, we said uh, in the survey that we want to have a two hours meeting and uh, the two hours is almost up. It doesn't mean that the meeting has to end, but maybe it's a time to uh, say farewell to anyone who does want to go do other stuff. Uh, and then we can resume chatting whoever wants. Yeah, uh, I've got to hop off, but thanks for planning this. Uh, it's a good chat and cool to see everyone's projects. Hope to see you around. Same also out. Thank you. Yep, I gotta head out too. But yeah, this was this was really great. Uh, thanks for organizing it, and uh, I look forward to to seeing more with uh, all these projects going forward. I guess I'm gonna follow the mass, mass exodus. But thank you everyone for presenting and for the questions. Ayala, I'm not letting you go just because I fear technically it would break the meeting. Yeah, I'll stay, I'll stay. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so, Paul, are you still here? No. Okay. I feel Paul raised an interesting question, though. I'm curious whether anybody has something to say about what Paul uh, asked uh, on the chat about live programming. And uh, yeah, like if you have, I mean, the full like runtime history of your program, I mean, how do you uh, portray that in a way that is meaningful uh, to, a, to a user? Does anybody have thoughts on that? Uh, definitely. It's something that we have uh, focused on um, so I can show you, I guess, explain what goes on in Lambda. Please. Um, so, okay. So normally, most of the time, maybe you're editing code, you want to see it succinctly without extra stuff, but maybe you want it to look like Java and see types everywhere. So you can enable it. Maybe it helps you. Um, and we made up this notation that it goes under each sub expression, but not totally under everything. So here, so it doesn't take more vertical space. So the modulus three, uh, like, or equals equals zero, the bool goes only after the, under the right side and some stuff are obvi obvious. Numbers are numbers. So we don't show everything. When you turn on evaluation, we use the same places to show evaluation result under every sub expression. I think uh, it was uh, Brett Victor made uh, an article about how you don't want people to use hovers. Uh, you want stuff to be less interactive because like browsing with your eyes is easier. And also I think uh, compared to the sidebar in Hazel, you just see, the result of each sub expression under that sub expression and it replaces the need to extract it to a variable and do like a print print statement debugging and uh, you can browse between different invocation scopes of the function um, and 
to be honest, it's more of a proof of concept. Currently, we record the first 10 invocations. But in theory, I want us to be able that any function invocation within you could go into that and view the evaluation of these inputs. And because it's a functional paradigm, I can show the value of a variable under that variable. Uh, yeah, I think Jonathan has actually affected us to go the functional route for this. Uh, so yeah, num has one value. And I think this approach, I, I hope, makes functional programming accessible. Uh, and it uses functional programming to, yeah, you don't need uh, print debugging and you can see all the intermediate values. This is our design for it. Just a quick question. I know I don't have my hand up, but I know you mentioned against interactivity, but I am curious if I wanted to find out what the second element was in one of those lists where it's being alighted. Is there a, a reason, or I guess you can do it that way, right? Interesting. We can, we can browse the scopes and uh, yeah, we can see what happened in the, fil in the function filter and uh, it had this fold with this stuff. And oh, cool. um, we will have more stuff. Like I think what you're alluding to you can say it's kind of like breakpoints. Uh, maybe like find also like being able to go, what was the calling scope for this for the yeah, we'll want a lot of all the stuff I'm missing from whatever I'm currently using in Python, we will want to have at some point. All right. Yeah, I also think this is a really interesting question because I really ran into this when uh, designing the live evaluation features of Google. Um, and one of the um, problems I uh, found out a bit late about is how do you handle very large uh, data structures or even infinite computations? Uh, and I found that like slightly deviating from the uh, shared vision that was presented at the start, I think lazy evaluation can be really useful here because you can only compute the part of the data structure that you can show and you, you're not going to show infinite data structure. So that solves that part of the problem. Um, but also you have um, a, a term without a or without a weak at normal form, if you want to show the value of that, you will just keep computing to show maybe even a single number. And uh, I feel like this is um, yeah, not trivial to handle in a nice way. Uh, what I implemented for Frugal is a kind of bounded evaluation mode where um, the evaluation stops after like say 20, uh, 20 reductions and this number is, number is configurable. Um, and then this always gives you some information. And if there's more information that comes back later, it will replace it. Um, but I really think this should be nicer in some way. Um. Yeah, so I guess, I mean, I don't have a demo uh, to show of this, unfortunately, but yes, yeah, so I mean, uh, I should say, yeah, like I have long admired the uh, the Lambda approach uh, with uh, annotations. Uh, they're both for types uh, and for values. And I mean, I, I do definitely agree that uh, there's something to be said as opposed to the Hazel sidebar of sticking these things in line, like, I mean, forming the direct relationship uh, between the syntax and like various kinds of like attributes or, or derived qualities uh, thereof. But yeah, like I, I do feel that like, I mean, again, I, I really do like the way Lambda does it because it is a very difficult layout problem. I've tried to wrestle with myself and I think that, yeah, I mean, like I'm, I'm not convinced you can do much better uh, on that than the way you guys are doing it now. But like one thing that, that I would like to see explored is more like uh, dramatically different projections uh, for special purposes. So like to that effect, one thing I've been thinking of is, I mean, again, this is quite similar to some Lambda ideas, but like taking your extant syntax and projecting it into like uh, different normal forms that are kind of more 
more linearized. So like, I mean, in, in this sense, kind of like uh, if you have some kind of like heavily nested computation to break it down uh, into like intermediate named values. So you basically kind of have a column of names, a column of code, and then a column of like intermediate runtime values uh, along uh, the side. Because I feel, you know, the, the fundamental scaling issue uh, with the inline representation is when your value becomes a lot longer uh, than the code uh, that generates it. And I mean, for some cases like lists, there's like intelligent ways to elide it. But if it's a bunch of like nested algebraic data types, like it, it becomes a little bit uh, more difficult. So like, I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, it's like, I want to avoid kind of the traditional debugger experience where you step away from the syntax. But I think in some sense, it makes sense to like dramatically change how the syntax is presented uh, from for the point of view of getting uh, more more live values on screen, even to the point of going to something Excel like where like you show the live values primarily, and then only show the implementation like on hover or something like that. Anyway, just ideas, but Um, yeah, I, I would say that uh, in this situation, and it can become very messy, and usually I would turn the annotations off uh, and only see them when I'm actually in debugging mode. Um, but if it's too cluttered and you want to extract uh, sub-expressions, uh, we have a simple keystroke for that. It extracts something to a let expression. And the key thing, it's like, we have an interesting idea about naming in general. So we want to take as, in general, we want to take as much uh, tedious stuff that the programmer now does uh, to make it unnecessary. So formatting and naming goes there as well. So if you extract something to a let item, it would get an automatic name assigned to it according to its type. If there's a name clash, it would auto automatically get a suffix, like it would be num0, num1, num2. Uh, because we have the opposite problem, we're not doing uh, figuring out what the name refers to. We are figuring out how to present uh, you know, to the user that it's referring to this variable. Um, so in general, in code, I think, you should extract a sub expression when you have a good name to give to it, and it will make the code more readable. Um, like sometimes, this is also true in work, uh, people extract uh, sub expressions of big expressions and give nonsense names to, to them, like maybe names that have to do of how this thing was computed or. Uh, but not, but don't tell the essence of what this thing is and don't add information to it. And in this case, I usually prefer not to have it to, to be extracted. Like, so giving, extracting things and giving them names, I think ideally is something that you would do. Uh, maybe you see this thing is too cluttered, but you actually see a value for it. So maybe it, the essence of it is clear in your head and you will be able to extract it and give a good name to it. And then like, yes, you'll have a less cluttered view, <laughs> but it will be an interactive uh, process to reach that point. One thing I come up, came up with when thinking about this kind of cluttering problem is instead of um, showing types or values in addition to the program, just replace the expressions with the values they have. And of course, you still have scaling problems here, um, but this saves a little bit of, bit of space at least. Um, and you have also still have the nesting problem. Um, I think you um, maybe you could mitigate this a bit by um, having a keyboard shortcut for navigating different levels of like the uh, yeah, expression tree uh, and then the value of a yeah a combined expression would take the whole space of that combi combined expression. Um, yeah, some minor ideas to, to help with this.
Okay, so my turn. And um, so about the showing the result, results of uh, expressions, I actually, I can show you in my project. And it's also an excuse for showing my project. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, so uh, here I have actually a Lisp style and uh, here I have more space at the bottom so I can uh, write a result of evaluation. And if I create a function, it's actually, oh yeah, and it's named uh, randomly if I create more functions. Yeah, and for example, if here will be a num and uh, it will be num plus uh, 10 and I here execute, uh, oh, it's a John, okay. Yeah, great. And I will pass here 25. So yeah, it just shows uh, the last one that was called. Alexander, what if uh, there is a nested expression? Like if it was num times num plus 10? Okay, let's try it. So it, uh, you would like num times? Inside, in, just uh, replace num with num times num. Okay, I cannot do this. I can okay. actually. Uh, so it, I only need to uh, create it yeah. out of the, no so it will be 10. And this will be uh, num times num and run again so it will be john and 25 all the time yeah here mm -hmm. it is okay yeah, so and um, yeah okay so i would say we are pretty much doing the same thing on this you're showing uh, under each sub expression right? yeah mm -hmm. Wanted to add, uh, I will I still under uh, development, so I will add uh, like questioning there, but uh, it depends on how I will uh, solve the issue of uh, user experience back like in the future. Um, so yeah, I kind of wanted to identify uh, like an interesting common theme I felt that yeah exists across Frugal Lando and uh, like the stuff, the hypothetical stuff that I was talking about. Where like I mean, and this is you know currently realized really nicely in Lando, I think. Whereas like I mean, you have certain things that are traditionally or currently thought of like rewrites or refactors, like extracting a let, uh, replacing an expression uh, with its value, etc. Like it, it to me, I think yeah, there's just so much uh, potential in exploring these things, not as like uh, changes to the code base per se, but like just as reprojections that you're doing for a particular task, like a particular uh, debugging task, or even you're just like trying to visually clarify part of the code for somebody. Like I think it was really apt bringing out naming because like naming is always a weird thing, right? Like I feel like that changes so much when I'm writing code, both I'm changing names, but then I'm also changing like which intermediates are actually the named ones. So being able to quickly, you know, switch to a projection where like a bunch of stuff is named and like kind of see, okay, like maybe this seems like a natural level of abstraction and then kind of folding stuff up again, feels super natural. And uh, yeah, like it, it, it's, it's it, I mean, yeah, like I think, you know, the editor of the future, like whatever shape it took, I would definitely want to be able to do this kind of like rapid switching uh, between special purpose forms, depending on what I was doing at any given time. Oh, I guess I want to say too, like one other uh, thing that I just, I feel like I started ridiculous. I, I want to be able to do this in the current editor is just inlining, like, as opposed to like jump to function definition, like just being able to like, yeah, like see in situ uh, a function body. I feel that's like a super useful tactic that, you know, usually is dealt with in editors now by opening up two independent panes. Uh, but really, I just want to, you know, see where it is. Like in particular, if I'm like navigating in the context of some kind of uh, concrete program trace, like you could potentially do some kind of slicing where like you don't need to insert the whole, you don't need to inline the whole function body, but only like the relevant case or match branches for that particular uh, application. So you want that to, um, to debug and understand what happened or as an edit? Well, as I mean, I guess both, but I'm thinking primarily in terms of debugging or even just reading code for the first time, like as opposed to jumping to a definition, just seeing like what it would look like on rolled uh, in that context. Mm -hmm. I can answer your question. Actually, uh, in my uh, 
I have a canvas, so I can open the definition of function next to its call, and uh, it looks like this. So one more sharing. For example, if I actually click here and click open definition, it just brings the code here. Or if I cl uh, click like uh, on the la latest one, it just brings here. And for same for, for example, plus, and it just arranges here. Or I can actually open more and see more. Yeah, I mean, I like that a lot, how you're building up the, the tree structure. Everything is in its place as opposed to just dissociated panels of code. Yeah. And also, if you open, I can sh I can show borders of each object, and then it will be like this. So it will um, push it away. I do not. I uh, when uh, in comparison to blueprints in Unreal Engine, you have to manually and Blender. You have to manually put nodes in a space. I don't like this. I like automatic automatic uh, layout. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a lot of things that VPLs fall down on is it just like it's now you have two problems. And uh, yeah, like it's it's a lot of indirect references crossing all over the place. It's uh, I mean, spaghetti. It's a, a new form of spaghetti code. Yeah, I, I do not say I will solve this uh, like cross references or um, uh, it will not be like a solution for this, but at least you don't have to manually drag uh, nodes around the screen. Maybe to come back to a different aspect of this question, okay. because you don't uh, in like real world, world pro programs, you often also have just really big data structures for uh, very many evaluations of a function, and um, finding the values you're interested in there is also an interesting problem of, of itself, I think. Um, so I wonder if people here already have some ideas about this, or maybe you could do a, a collaborative brainstorm, something like that. <laughs> uh, sorry, Colin, can you repeat the technical? So in real world uh, programs, there's often very big data structures mm -hmm. that you're inspecting or there's uh, very many evaluations of a uh, function, which gives you uh, many alternative values for the different evaluations. And uh, designing a nice um, interaction to uh, find the values you're interested in at that moment in this large amount of data is an interesting problem of itself, I think. And I wonder if people have ideas about that. So, I mean, I think this is, yeah, this is huge as a general thing. And I'm, I'm like, it's everything that I, 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 I've thought of so far, I feel is very much in the space of special purpose heuristics. But one thing I thought I have thought of here is like in the case where like, so you're debugging and you're getting these like large nested algebraic data types or big composites of lists uh, spat out. And like, usually like there is one point or just a couple points that you're inside that large nested structure that you're interested in. That's some kind of like little mechanic where you can like, click on a sub branch and then kind of like drag it out to its own line. And what that does is like it automatically extracts some kind of lens uh, down into that data structure so that on subsequent reruns, uh, you can see like the lens value uh, of that, that top level structure, I think, which is something that works if uh, like uh, that structure is, is, is sufficiently similar between runs that that lens still points. Uh, at you know a discrete point in that data structure, but you could make it slightly fuzzy too. So like I mean, if the lens kind of goes down like n many levels, if like the new structure only has k less than n levels to it, you still see like a prefix or something. But yeah, I mean anyway, I definitely agree on this general uh, subject that like exploring both like large amounts of traces and then large data with individual traces is uh, like the the UI challenge in the live programming space. Yeah. I, I currently feel that I use debuggers and print debugging in C++ and, and in Python. And uh, that if I 
could switch to the functional sphere and make it be in Lambda, even if it was an interactive process. Uh, so it would have like the inputs from the environment recorded. Um, so, so yeah, so just seeing, having access to everything, maybe I need, uh, so if I, if I can run the thing and it's pure and it's giving the same stuff and I want the specific lens, I guess and I can add a let to compute, you know, okay, I want to see what's there in the, uh, you know, the specific, uh, some computation of the huge structure. I can do that and it's there. I somehow feel maybe it won't be ideal, but it will be so much better than what I currently have. It reminds me a bit of watch expressions in some debuggers where you can like drill down in the value if it like sports uh, like dot syntax or something like that and then you immediately see uh, that part of the record when you're at that uh, breakpoint or something and then you can also do some um, yeah arbitrary computation there if you want to um, it, and but then you want to make it a bit fuzzy so it works with many uh, different values, right? This some of Rolly's stuff you pulled up here. Uh, this is uh, Jonathan Edwards, but maybe Rolly. Oh, this is, is, oh, this uh, is Subtech. OK, yeah, he's got similar? a similar yep, kind of yep. interaction, but yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it's just um, it's similar to what Alexander showed. But, uh, so I wanted to uh, pull it here. It's uh, Jonathan was here before we left, but this is is early subtext stuff. He I think he pivoted from this design, uh, but it's similar, uh, and it has this nice like um, thing that shows what opens from what, um, which is nice I think. Uh, like Alexander, like yo. If you had the like the box, you could have like the this uh, shape like expanding into the box of the evaluation. I just wanted to to show this one. Yeah, looks cool. Yeah, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll I'll put the link. Yeah. Anyway, I I need to run now. But yeah, thanks so much for organizing today. This has been this has been great. Yeah. Thank Bye, you. everybody. I'm going to. Thank you so much for organizing. Yeah, same here. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks. Nice meeting you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this was very interesting. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. yeah, I guess that's a wrap. All right. Thanks all for coming. So, Bye. take care. See you around. See you around.